a social, uh, these are concepts we are gonna see in the class. So this is just for you to start thinking about them and what you already know about them before the class and then you answer again at the end to see how it changes. Okay, time's up, so send whatever you have. It doesn't, uh, it's okay if it is not fully complete. And let's move on with the lecture for today. Okay, guys, good weekend? Did you sleep? No. no. Are you ready for your exam later today? No. The, today, I hope, I hope that this is, it, this is today's session is not as, as hard as other sessions, I think. So hopefully you can have also a little bit of, you know, breathing uh, uh, space and, you know, um, so you're a bit more calm for the rest of it. Because, I, uh, yeah, I remember, it can, be, it can be really hard. It will be fine. And today's gonna be, I think, also very interesting to discuss other things around our work as scientists that can really influence how we reach our conclusions as well and how we make our prior assumptions that then we, we test through hypothesis testing and everything we've seen. Um, and this is the influence that the scientific community as a whole has on what gets published 
basically, and you know who gets funded, and uh, how these decisions are taken, and what biases are pervasive in this process. And we think it's really important to discuss this point because sometimes, um, and I think that's correct too, we try to get rid of our own biases when we do an experiment and when we do everything that we've talked about. But we have to be, uh, you know, very conscious that everyone has biases and they play, you know, themselves into what we read in the literature and how we form our ideas. And that's not really, you know, our own biases in our own scientific endeavor. It's something else that we're getting fed into and we need to be very careful about what we read so we can catch them too. I know this is all sounds like, oh, you know, everyone has biases and everything, you know, it's complicated. And it is, um, but hopefully we're going to discuss some tools that you can use to be aware of such uh, traps, let's say. Okay, so first, question for you guys. What do you think is the impact of the scientific community on data-driven research results? What gets published? What, what can, can you think? This is related to the questions maybe that you just Answer, but does someone has any idea? Talis? Ah. Ah, oh. that, yeah, well, I suppose that it's, since it's a, it's a kind of research that sometimes rely very much on the interpretation of what you are seeing, I think the things that the scientific community thinks that's true or that it's a, actual, a, at least something that you would expect from that result should uh, influence a lot what the researcher is going to see in his or her exactly. data. Exactly, and that's a specific kind of bias that we will actually talk about, but yes, that is correct. David? Um, I was thinking maybe it could be about what is the research, uh, because I don't know if the scientific community say, this is not important, why you are going to spend money doing this? Right. So maybe our bias... They don't fund it. Yes. And if and you don't have money, you don't have research. <laughs> and you're missing a fundamental part of research, right? That is correct too. And that's another, another, bias, that we, that another bias that we will also discuss. So this, all of this is correct. And some researchers have actually studied this and classified um, biases and the impact of the scientific community in several different uh, biases. Here we're going to focus on three that we think are maybe the most um, pervasive or maybe important that have the most impact, but there are many, actually, and, and there's books on this. If you're interested, I can recommend some uh, um, about you know the influence that other people have, you know, in the research that gets done and published. So basically, um, biases perpetuated by the scientific community can alter the interpretation and conclusions of scientific research, and that's a lot to do with data-driven projects because. You know, it's who gets funded. Data-driven projects are usually the ones that require more funding, for example, and have more specific research agendas. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and uh, that's, uh, that's really most of the ones that are affected by these biases. And we're going to discuss each of these. So we have activities today um, because this is mostly, you know, to do with discussion and thinking as a group how you think these affect publication, each of them specifically, and what we can do to avoid them. The first one we will discuss is publication bias. And basically that means that positive results are more likely to be published. So from Wikipedia again, for certain things, is, is, you know, Wikipedia is a very good <laughs> source of knowledge, not for your actual academic work, guys. This is just for uh, uh, you know, discussing a topic, it's fine. But okay, publication bias occurs when the outcome of an experiment or research study biases the decision to publish or otherwise distribute it. Publishing only results that show a significant finding distorts the balance of findings in favor of positive results. Now, um, why is this the case, do you think? Why do you think that only or mostly positive findings get published? Why not publish all findings? <laughs> My answer is really not that good, but <laughs> probably because it's more interesting to read an article that has a positive has a narrative. Result. Maybe yes. that that is true. Maybe it's more interesting as a story. True. Well, I'd say that for for something like for something to be brown, uh, it means uh, that it isn't uh, 
a whole bunch of other things. It isn't yellow, to, it isn't red, it isn't green and the like. So essentially a positive thing tends to be uh, e equivalent to a whole series of negative results. So if you, if you publish one negative result, it may, it may imply the same level of effort, but it doesn't necessarily imply the same level of knowledge. So I think people tend to refuse right. it. It's like paradigm breaking, you know, publishing something positive. It goes maybe as a new finding. Yes. Right? It goes, as you say, maybe something that developed, we already knew that. Or, you know, it's not that, um, how do you say, yeah, shifting yeah. in our knowledge. Also, but yeah, I, I think you are just giving a good point here for the discussion because we are going to focus like an, on the negative part of the publication bias. But also, like, if we would just open it, right, like anything is publishable, there is an infinite ways to get a negative result. <laughs> and not yeah. all of them are meaningful, informative, or anything else. But we also have negative results that are very informative. Because the people is asking the same and the same and the same, and they get negatives, and those that don't get published until you get the actual positive, right? So really good point. So yeah. uh, that's right. I think there was a ah, question or, or a comment. Or a comment? No? Did you raise your hand? I was just thinking about uh, the bias of the writer is the same bias of the reader, so. In many cases, yes. Yes, uh, and we will discuss that one as well in the last one, I guess. Um, the writer and the reader. Confirmation bias, a thing that relates to. So that is all correct. And basically, how people have discovered or studied or found out that there is a publication bias is via these things called the funnel plot. So um, basically, if everything was in an ideal world and there was no publication bias, what people would expect, in theory, is for a certain number of studies studying the same thing. You have some studies that are larger, better powered, who we're seeing have more statistical power. And people expect that those ones that have larger sample sizes, um, have, uh, yeah, basically are better statistically powerful, have more precision. That means they are actually better at estimating the real effect size, or whatever you're studying, a drug, whatever. And if the real effect size, let's say, is in this line, basically what people expect is that as your precision goes up, then those studies will actually zoom in to the real effect size. Whereas if you have low power studies, they will, you know, sometimes overestimate the effect size, sometimes underestimate the effect size, and that's expected because you don't have enough power. But this is, you know, more or less what people would expect if you plot this. However, what people, how some people have seen is that this is what happens. So this is what you expect and this is what you see. So for the positive, they all get published because it's positive. And it's like, oh, a new finding, you see a real effect. And all these ones for the negatives are, well, you know, I didn't find anything. Oh, this drug doesn't have an effect. Maybe, you know, it's not worth publishing, or the journal decides not to, or the scientist decides it's a waste of time, or many other reasons, right? So, um, many people that studied this have produced these plots and said, well, I am missing a bunch of points there, therefore those studies must exist and didn't get published. That's what they think, and maybe something that we can discuss, because other people have actually said this is not necessarily true, because even though in theory this is true, Making a funnel plot like this is actually very hard in practice because you need to make sure that all these studies are actually studying the exact same thing. And as we saw in the first class, people actually refer to different things, you know, with the same words. And sometimes having a plot like this, people say, is actually not evidence because these studies are not homogeneous. So this is something that we can discuss, but basically is the underlying observation that along you know, everyone's experience that has spent, you know, a few months in science already knows what careers are built on, right? Positive results and good publications, right? Higher impact. So, our first questions here, and you will get into teams for a little bit of time to discuss this. So basically, these are the questions. Basically, first, is there a publication bias? And if so, why do you think there is a publication bias? Do you think it's important for science? Why would it be important? And what does it mean for the scientists working on this field, the decision makers, if you're working, for example, in a pharmaceutical company, 
and patients in the case that it's something related to drugs. Now, uh, David was asking me the other day uh, where, you know, there are journals that don't seem to be interested in negative results. Um, and that is true. Many of the high impact journals have traditionally rejected null studies, as people call them. But some studies, some journals then rec recognize this problem and arose and basically are called the journal of negative results. Now, sadly, when I was yesterday putting these logos here to show you, at least two of these don't exist anymore. And that can also, <laughs> that can also tell you a little bit about the state of this um, situation. But at least there is some recognition in the scientific community that this may be a problem and is trying to um, address it. Right, so now do this. <laughs> so yes, uh, the activity is again going to be by teams. I, I guess we can click here. Hopefully it shares as well. Go, go to it. Uh, oh, now you can see that Daniela has many tabs. <laughs> Anyway, um, okay, I don't know how to make it look pretty here, but I will figure it out later. But I'm also going to share it in a Slack with you. But yeah, because you cannot see anymore the. Can, I don't know how to move. Can you go back to the presentation? I go back to the presentation. Well, no, it doesn't matter. You have it in a Slack. Don't go. Don't do it. Don't do it. It's okay. Okay, so you have it in a Slack now. You can go here. Uh, you should be able to modify it. So the idea is that by teams, go to your usual teams. You're gonna have five minutes to do some group dis uh, discussion with your teams. And then we are gonna come back here and discuss it five minutes. And the idea is that any general main points that you have, you're gonna put it here as plus tips. And then we all can see what other teams uh, put on it. And it's gonna be the same board for all the other questions and activities. So yes, oh, you did that? Who did it? Uh, I did it. Oh, great, so good to know. Perfect, yes, thank you. Okay, so uh, five minutes by teams. Go to your usual teams. Is in the teams you have been like working most of the activities? Six different teams by colors? Go to those teams. Everybody is in board number one, so publication bias activity. Si quieres regresar.
One more minute and we go to discussion. Okay, so let's discuss your comments, results, discussion. That's redundant. Let's discuss your discussion. Uh, that's weird. Okay, so um, again, by teams, who wants to start? Like, I I'm gonna share a screenshot of uh, this board, so you have it. But uh, let's just start by teams saying what were your main points. What, sorry, <laughs> what you asking now? No, okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, I would say that we were discussing that publication bias is not just like this natural tend to publish at positive results. It's all the things that are not related to the work itself that will uh, influence the reviewer. And like we were seeing in the last class, the, the work uh, that it was from NASA and then were published on Nature. And this type of things influence the reviewer, like the, the lab you are coming from, the university you are coming from, uh, the topic you are uh, writing about. So all these things can make you more possible to be published or not. There's not related to the work itself, so it's publication bias. Yes, yes, really good point. Thank you. Yeah, that's a really, really important point. Um, definitely happens much more that we will uh, like it to be, and no one knows how to fix this because we all have our prejudices. Bias? Well, no, I wanted to use a different word. Anyway, <laughs> other team? Who wants to? Uh, we also discussed that uh, with the publication bias, the scientists are more susceptible to commit fraud to have good results mm -hmm. to present. True. Yes. True, and that is also another, another big problem. Um, uh, well, not, maybe not big, because I think there was a study that showed that only about 0.2% of studies that had been analyzed had some fraud. But the ones that have fraud, tend to be ones that get picked up for like cancer drugs and these kinds of things. So actually, some of them, even though maybe they're few, they have a big, big impact. Yes, but we are actually discussing that in incentive biases. That is, and, and, and that's part of the way we artificially splitted these things, right? You're gonna see at the end of the class, they are all interconnected, but maybe we can get into more detail about that in the incentive bias, but definitely True. you see it in the publications. Uh, another team? We discussed something, <coughs> sorry, we discussed something that a lot of people seem to have discussed as well, which is the waste of money that is generated when you don't publish negative results. A lot of other scientists can do the same experiments mm -hmm. as you and then you waste money and resources to achieve the same conclusions. And that is a big problem. Ah, sorry, no, go first. No, yeah, after, okay. No, that is a big problem because 
imagine 10 teams do the same research and they found negative results and they're like, whatever. And then one team does the same study and finds a positive result and that's the one that gets published. So everyone gets the idea that that thing has a positive result, whereas you know the whole evidence shows you that it doesn't, but we can't see it. P-values, oh, P-values, tomorrow, P-values. This is something that we didn't discuss very much, but um, because we have to publish because of funding uh, and have to, to be a lot of um, words, um, this publication bias can also um, influence the areas that are going to be the researchers going to work because in some areas are more difficult to to get um, number of cases or results in the case of neglected disease. And because of these, many researchers change the, the area that they're gonna work. True. Yes, like the hot topics, right? You're gonna choose a hot topic because you get more funding, because it's easier to publish, because people seem to think it's more relevant, but you're, we are missing all the other uh, fields of study. So here. No, I just have like a question. When you say negative results, you mean the ones that those don't follow your hypothesis, or what do you mean by no results? So okay. you have a hypothesis and you don't find that to be true. What you expected? So yeah. it's like, oh, what you know, my no was true. Those are the ones that okay. should be informative, but are usually not published for. Many yes, reasons. and basically that means you don't know the answer. Like uh, when you put a hypothesis, it's a very specific thing, and you say if this is true, I know the answer of whatever was my question. If it, that is not true, it is still can be anything, right? So the negative, that's also why it's more open and less valuable. If something was very yes or no, like it, how do you say that? Like, uh, falsifiable? Like, no, the, like a hypothesis should always be falsifiable, but you only have two answers, right? It's either red or black then the negative result is just as good as the positive. But normally that's not the thing. You have an open question and the negative still gives you, the, lefts you in the dark in a way. That's why they are less value. Yeah, uh, I don't know. I was just thinking now that generally when you have a hypothesis and then you deny it, you don't stop working in what you were working. And then you continue, 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 and sometimes you get some, some results. And so the, the biggest part of the, the works that I see, they had this like, no, 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 and then yes. And so the maybe these negative, the negative uh, uh, results are inside the positive ones, mm -hmm. but it's just not show it. It's not uh, one work just to that, because it will. Yes. So you're basically describing the ideal situation, right? The thing is you sometimes like never find the jazz, so you never publish all your nose because you never find the jazz. And also uh, like we are gonna touch in the next part incentives. Uh, sometimes the, the funding money runs out, so you have to leave it. Sometimes the person who was working on it because you're gonna see it, who is actually doing the science are grad students and postdocs. Uh, investigators, we want to believe it's us, but it's, like, it's rarely us. They are the ones doing it. And then when they leave, sometimes also the projects die because you have like multiple things going on and when the person who was really interested in or was the expert of it leaves, sometimes projects just never get to the point uh, when you actually got the full story. Um, I'm just sharing what we thought. Uh, and it's very similar to what uh, the other group said about uh, when you don't publish negative results, you don't share uh, your, your uh, wrong method, let's say, no, it's not wrong, but uh, your failure and other people can do the same and not only waste money, but time. Some experience take a lot of time. But there's another thing on this that is negative results, as Ron said, they are part of the the positive information that you got. So this contributes to the lack of reproducibility and that also contributes for people not understanding how a system works because negative results are really important to understand how system work and you can think other things to research on those systems. So they are really important too. Mm -hmm. It's part of the whole you know, um, uh, process of doing science and we're just getting a biased uh, view of it, right? Yes, and I think also uh, that, that reminds us that in biology, biological complex, uh, systems are so complex that we rarely have like an absolute answer, right? It's never like if you were doing math that like, you, when you find the right answer, you can prove it's the right answer and that's it, right? So to actually 
argue for whatever is what we define as the right answer, you usually say, as we did with the paper on Friday, right? Like, a, oh, this explanation is not, this explanation is not, so this is the most probable one, right? So you always build it on top of the negative results. That's a really good point. Mm -hmm. I just want to ask something, is that besides the journal of negative uh, results, is there any other things um, happening to kind of um, deal with this publication bias? Because I'm, I'm thinking that now we have such a, like a big network of scientists in the social media on this kind of stuff. So you can yes. also uh, share your work, even if it's not published, if you think it's not worth Yes. Uh, publishing, but you can also tell everyone what you are doing. Yes, of course, the bioarchive, the preprint servers now, they, they, you can post your work. And sometimes people just say, I just want to post it and not really send it to a peer-reviewed journal. I just want to show the world what I did. And many people actually leave it there, and that's something good for... So there are, that is a very good point. That's something to be done. Also something that we will see in the reproducibility class tomorrow, I think. It is. Um, there are people now funding uh, reproducibility studies for, for, for you know, drugs and things that, oh, you know, we calculate it has a this effect size according to this meta-analysis. Can we redo this, like, again, in a well-powered study? Can we reproduce it? In many cases, as we will see, they find that the effect sizes are much smaller than what previously reported. And that helps with a little bit with this kind of bias, saying, well, we thought it was this because of what's published and actually it's not that uh, much. But there's more funding agencies now trying to fund studies just to reproduce other studies, basically. So um, also I wanted to add what you're saying. I think uh, in the discussion right now, we are kind of framing the publication process as the gatekeeper of this. But the bias doesn't start with the publication process. It just starts with ourselves, right? So whenever you get a, like a negative result, like you want to do a, a, some kind of experiment and it's just not working. Like if you decide to tell the world, like I'm doing this and it's not working, there is always something in your head like, well, it's not working because it's not the way to do it or because I'm doing it wrong. So it, it requires some kind of, you know, like a bravery to tell the world like this is not, I try it this way, this way, this way, and it's not when maybe I am the one doing it wrong, you know? Or maybe someone is gonna come and tell you, well, Obviously, it was this thing. We, we feel ashamed all the time. So the bias for not publication or not openly saying the negative results actually start with, I think, a problem of uh, self-confidence, to be honest. Um, but yeah. OK, so let's move on to the next session. So we will share. Screen yeah, we can discuss more details at the end with everything in, in the same context. OK, guys. Let's go to this. Okay, that was what we were doing right now. Um, so, incentives. What do you think about when I tell you incentives? Incentives are also shaping. What do you think, sorry? <laughs> ah, there's a. No, you know, maybe in science, it could be like awards, like recognition. Uh, awards. Yeah, awards. Awards, yes, money, funding, yeah. uh, everything related to that. Uh, over there in the back, do we have another? I can take it, but I don't know where the other one is. Well, we'll find it. Well, I think that the general context in which we do science, and it has always been like this, is that the funding is coming from somewhere. Mm -hmm. So. Ultimately, and like if we, no matter how much we, we may want to deny it, we're all serving to a certain extent the interests of, of either capital or state ideology or religion, uh, depending on what moment in history, what, what place you're looking at. Exactly, we always have, well, funders especially, always uh, have an agenda, right? They have an interest and usually that can impact the results of the, of the studies that you're doing. So, who here recognizes this study? This is a very famous study. What do you think this is? Oh, this is the anti-vaccine guy. The what, the what? The anti-vaccine guy. The anti guy. Yeah. What is this study? What, what, what's the thing that this study said? 
the first sentence. Onset of behavioral symptoms were associated by the parents with measles, mumps, and rubella vaccination. This is the paper that really legitimized the movement of autism is caused by vaccines. This is a very strong movement uh, uh, still going on, right? And you know, all of these things that you may have heard about the COVID vaccines, you know, they have chips and they have, I don't know why, people were saying lots of things about the COVID vaccines and they all have roots in these kinds of things. The problem is, of course, that this paper was published by The Lancet. The Lancet is one of the most prestigious medical journals and it was at the beginning not questioned, like everyone was like, oh, well, that makes sense, right? And what do you think really, I mean, after many years have passed and people have constantly disproven this, um, I think I have added here, um, all of these uh, people have studied this case over and over again because it did a lot of damage to the world in general. Um, this thing about behavioral symptoms being associated with um, vaccination, can you think about why, why people seem to resonate with it and be like, yeah, that makes sense? <laughs> no, any, any, you know, because people, a lot of people, the, 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 the reason it got so powerful is because other parents of children were like, yes, this makes sense, right? Well, the only thing I could think of is that, in general, uh, parents uh, deposit a lot of expectations in, in what their children should, should be like and what they should become. So uh, if they are already showing signs that those expectations will be uh, put to death, uh, it is good to find an external uh, yes. cause, some, some uh, very, very uh, tangible thing to blame. So, exactly. Uh, that is a very important part of the reason. And the other one is this, uh, prob uh, this uh, confusion between correlation and causation. So usually, basically, uh, vaccines are administered when children are, I don't know, between three and four years old or something like that, that these vaccines. And that's when this, uh, what happened here? That's when this, um, when these uh, signs of behavioral changes are diagnosed. It's, a, it's about the same time. So they get vaccinated and then a few months later, it's like, oh, you know, they have, you know, they've been diagnosed with these changes. And what they can think of is exactly an external factor being like, oh, but I just vaccinated my child. That must be the reason. So it was a combination in this case of, you know, um, interests that we will see now and it resonating really with the experience of parents that had children that were diagnosed with this. Sorry about this. I don't know why this happened, but, um, oh, okay. Well, you can look at this one in the meanwhile. This happens all the time? Oh, okay. It's the first time it happens there. But anyway, uh, an important thing here to notice is that, uh, is this paragraph. See, I mean, lots of people have studied this. Of course, it has been disproven over and over again. But basically, this is a key paragraph, right? Um, Wakefield, who's the first author here, had a serious conflict of interest because his research was secretly funded by personal injury lawyers whose clients were suing the MMR vaccine makers. Right? So they had this movement that existed already, but it was not that legitimized, of parents suing these um, uh, com pharmaceutical companies for this reason. And they funded this study in which, you know, it made it le legit because he published in The Lancet these things. And then they were like, you see, it's true. Therefore, you know, give me money. So it was a lot of interest playing here. And now this is a classical case of fraud. And you know, this collective, um, you know, delving to the collective um, consciousness of people that were like, yes, that makes sense, right? Yes. <laughs> the thing is that that happens all the time in all the aspects. It's not just science, it's like, there's something always like behind it. Like there's money, exactly. there's power, and if something goes wrong, you can have bad results for yourself or whatever is around you. So I think like life is always bias of <laughs> people with money and power. It is true, but you know, I mean, I, I think the same because it's, we live in a world that is really hard to understand because of all these biases. But the problem with a study like this, in this case, is that people started saying, of course, like all pharmaceutical companies have all these interests, therefore they're evil, therefore they want money. 
And that's not really the case. Like, well, at least they're very well regulated for many of the medicines they come. And you know, people have been like, of course the cancer cure exists, but it's hidden because the pharmaceutical, this is not, like, you know, I mean, the problem with thinking that everything has interest is, is that then some people take it to the extreme, and then it's like everything is a conspiracy, right? Everything, the vaccines are a conspiracy, you know, everything. So it's, it's a hard line to walk because I also think in many cases it's so hard to, to understand. But for example, many cases, the pharmaceutical companies were like, well, actually, this is fraud and our vaccine is safe. And we did all of these you know, required studies to show you that it is safe to take or at least safe enough to administer to a you know, mass population. So you're right, but it's, it's hard you know, to immediately jump to conclusions. And that's why there's so many conspiracies around, like so many fake news everywhere. Conspiracy theorists are, yes, loads of conspiracy theorists and the man never landed in the moon. I mean, there's loads of them going around. But the, the, the most uh, interesting ones to me were these ones about the vaccine is gonna put a chip on you and the government is gonna control you. Where did, where did it come from, right? Um, <laughs> now, this is another example. Um, this was also, this is also a very good journal in medicine. And there was this paper called The Scientific Basis of Guideline Recommendations on Sugar Intake. And well, this study, I mean, I put you here the purpose of this study. It was a systematic review uh, to understand the guidelines on sugar intake you know, that exist in the world. Do you know people tell you or the labels tell you like this is, it has too much sugar or do not consume more than this because it's bad. And then they basically say, well, the conclusion is that the guidelines of dietary sugar do not meet criteria for trustworthy recommendations and are based on low quality evidence. Basically they're wrong. That's what this paper said. But an important thing to notice is this, the primary found, uh, funding source and of course, this at the beginning doesn't really tell you much. Like it's like the technical comedian diet, what is that, right, whatever. But then, in a very strange case of the Daily Mail actually getting it right, do not trust the Daily Mail usually, guys. It's terrible. But in this case, they got it right. In this case, they, got, they, they did their you know, investigation. And this thing, the International Life Science thing, this thing, International Life Science Institute, is basically, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, <laughs> and Mars Inc. Right, so of course, these guys funded some people to say in a prestigious journal, oh, you know, these regulations about sugar intake are wrong. Don't trust them, eat all the sugar you want, it's fine. And then they blamed um, uh, fat, the fat in the, it's not the sugar, it's the fat. And then that also was damaging because for a while people were like, oh, maybe it's actually the fat. And it's actually the sugar. <laughs> it's like, this, this has been also um, disproven. So you can see here that just, uh, yes, you have a question? Okay, I was just going to ask you like, how can we trust something? Like, how, why can uh, private companies like phone research, which is clearly for their benefit? Do you mean like, yeah, like why is that allowed and why would a journal accept that? That, that is an excellent question. Um, I think, so for example, in this case, for this study, um, it's interesting because it really never says anything like Coca-Cola and stuff. So they are hidden besides, so I can imagine myself reviewing this study and being like, I don't see any problems because I don't know. I mean, if you said Coca-Cola, you would be like, I mean, yes. But you know, sometimes they do these tricks in which they, I mean, they, they cannot lie because then that's fraud and they can be, you know, um, sued and they will lose love. So they cannot lie, but they can kind of hide it between but these layers. Most journals, at least nowadays, I don't know if by that time, they force you to tell like a, a sentence about your conflict of interest. Uh -huh. So if they are truly not lying, they should be saying, this is a conflict of interest. I don't know, have you checked that journal? That actual thing? I haven't, I just looked at the primary founding source. I don't know if they said anything. Probably not. I mean, we can, we can take a look, but it just got published. And usually when you have a strong conflict of interest, they stop it. 
they try, they bring on more peer reviewers because sometimes they say, well, you know, you can fund research, but it has to be well done research, and usually just gets more scrutiny. So you can do it. So Coca Cola can say, I'm going to fund this study, and if if it doesn't agree with what they think, they probably just publish it because it's like this goes against what you said. But if it agrees, they usually, it doesn't mean it's wrong, it just means, you know, it requires more, uh, a closer look. So you can do it because there's actually a lot of, um, these companies do a lot of that for tax purposes, like they fund research and that's usually not taxable, like they, it, hel it helps them with, I mean, it's all interest, right? But they do give a lot of money to research because it also benefits them. So it's complicated as well because sometimes, sometimes it doesn't come with strings. Sometimes it's like, yeah, it's Coca-Cola, but do whatever you want, study another thing, you know? And that's okay, but it is hard to judge. So in this case, yes. So it was published and people were like, what? And immediately, yeah, it was like, this is not, um, a well done study, at least it's very, um, yeah, conflicted. Uh, but it's also a hard line to walk because lots of money comes from private companies for research. Because governments and things, you know, they don't have a lot of money and much of it comes from, and, and it's fine, you can use it, but I guess you have to be very careful with that. Um, yeah, I guess we can uh, take the conversation to another level and argue if actually private money should be in science in the first place. Maybe it should never be, right? Uh, this is not going to be the most popular opinion, but I think uh, it's something to think about. But anyway, so go to your teams. Uh, that's it, right? Yeah. Board okay. number two. So go to your teams again. It is the board number two. It says incentives. Again, five minutes, and then we discuss all together, right? Andale, pollo anarquico. A ver, me voy a ir al board. Y luego sigue confirmation bias.
Okay, last 30 seconds. Put whatever you want, and we will move to discussion. I Okay, uh, everybody's here, right? Yes, okay, good. So, who wants to start sharing the main points of your discussion? Who wants to start? <laughs> this is working, yeah. Uh, we were team orange the orange things uh -huh. we were saying that maybe basic research is uh, left out of major funding opportunities for like more applied research that uh, companies want and also that that can produce misleading results well there's plenty of uh, examples like the anti-vax movement we were just talking about also cigarette mm -hmm. studies which were founded in the 60s or 70s by cigarette companies which people, they believe to be true because it comes from scientists, where it's like, okay, maybe one paper or two papers, and they believe that it's true because of like, science has this place of being holy and everything that science says is true. So, yeah, that. That is true, and one of these studies, like the Andrew Wakefield study, we just, we, you just need one to like impact, and then you have 3,000 studies disproving it, and they just, you know, they, they get, also with COVID prints as well. <laughs> like people were believing preprints to the point that ArcSIV or BioXIV or whatever had to start putting, oh, this is a preprint, this is not a peer reviewed publication. <laughs> yes, so I think preprints are great for the great majority of time, but sometimes people put out that, those kinds of studies that people just get and they go viral and sometimes you're like, well actually, anyone can upload the thing, which is great, mostly a good thing, but in the case of COVID, as you say, it's, yeah, it's complicated <laughs> with, with these yeah, topics. Uh, we discussed two things, well, several things, but for example, uh, we said that it's going to affect not only what you study, but how you study. So it is going to direct your methods towards a specific direction because you are funded and you want to get something. Uh, it can also make scientists to forcedly connect <laughs> topics, like you already studied the Amazon River and you say that it has to do with, I don't know, pancreatic cancer, <laughs> because they are funding you and you need to do it forcedly and it happens a lot. Yes. And also it can affect scientific integrity because if there is bribery behind, then, well, you are going to be very, very, uh, yes, manipulated. <laughs> And even if your funding is not coming from private money, uh, there's also a pressure uh, to keep publishing, so you keep mm -hmm. being funded. So there's also that kind of pressure. And other incentives, too, like prestige and awards, and people can uh, uh, make the, the, the research toward that kind of direction and forget. Flashy results. Yeah, flashy results and forget about other things that can also be important. Uh, yes, that's a really good point, and I think uh, like it's, it's you know touching in something that we need to emphasize here. Like sometimes when we have these discussions, we think about um, white and black, right? Like you you either like are like objective and doing good research, or you are selling yourself to the company. But it's actually like a lot of gray in between. I think when you start thinking about those things of I just want the prestige, then you oversell a little bit what you're saying. You kind of know it's not such a big deal, it's not really curing cancer, but uh, you, you start you know, moving <laughs> on the other direction and we are all subject to this because you are not gonna realize right away that you are doing something wrong. There is a lot of gray in between, so just keep checking yourself all the time. Ah, 
I was just thinking about that the way that we control in science this type of stuff is usually the peer review. Mm -hmm. But sometimes, uh, I'm arguing that sometimes peer review is not so fast in the same pace of that science happens. So this can produce this type of distortions like Coca-Cola <laughs> yes. produce it research. Yes, peer review is another whole topic. Yes, really important, but also like the people doing the peer review are not exempt of biases. Yeah. And sometimes like I think something we haven't touched at all is when you're reviewing the paper of someone who is really powerful in your field, you are either scared of retaliation or you are just, you know, tempt to believe whatever they say, even if it's, you're not using the same scrutiny you would use for maybe the same, exactly same research. Uh, if you, and, and I saw this in the questions at first, I'll check your answers really quick. Like if you were publishing from a university in Brazil or Mexico, like you're gonna be scrutiny friendly and it comes from the bias of the peer review. So uh, I don't know if incentive bias always is, is strictly about the outcomes of the research being questioned about the, f the because of the funding, but what we thought of also was that uh, many times applied science is put uh, before uh, basic science so perhaps you you'll tend in the case of data driven research you'll tend to analyze uh, medical records uh, and not ecological data or the like sure. because one in one case you perhaps just do a good description of of nature and of reality while in the other case you can see a profit may being made of, of of what you did very easily so sometimes uh, perhaps uh, major decisions in the life of scientific researchers will be made uh, towards the, uh, a more applied direction because of those incentives. Mm -hmm. so. Yes, that's definitely a really good point. And I, I would just add that it's not only applied versus basic, it is also being in the frontier of the science versus actually working on the foundation, right? So it definitely goes with application because of also the biases, uh, not the, the biases, the incentives of uh, profitable uh, research, but also the flashy results. It kind of connects together, right? I want to be the one discovering something new because that means prestige and that means uh, maybe the Nobel Prize and blah, 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 and we are all moving to the frontier and who is actually building a stronger stories, who is actually building a stronger understanding of what is behind. And we sometimes forget about that because of this bias. Do you want to add something because we are, I was talking here and then it has to do what you said that it, I think it gives incentives to not share your work, not to be open about what you do because if you have like a data set that is really important, you want to keep it to yourself, then you'll be the only one who will be, have control about this, who will be able to find out something using that data set. So you need you to be more uh, close about what you do because then the prestigious and all these kind of things we, we go only to, to you and not to other people that can use a data set and do something even better than what you did. Yes, no, definitely. Um, that, that is a big problem, <laughs> definitely. Um, data sharing is very complicated for many reasons. I mean. Ideally, everything would be. Uh, oh, sure. uh, sorry. Um, in many cases, it's um, it's to do with um, really the difficulties of actually sharing the data because sometimes, at least us working in the medical field, we're not allowed to to release certain bits of the data because those are identifiable, for example. But in many cases. It does have to do with hiding something, <laughs> maybe, right? So, you know, some cases like, oh, data is uh, available under request or something like that. It's very common to say in papers. And that's suspicious nowadays um, because those people, there have been studies. Actually, actually, we will review one of those studies, big studies, uh, I think on Thursday. No, Thursday we don't have a class. Wednesday, probably, um, where those people actually don't share the data. Like it says that in the paper and then you write to them and they disappear, you know, they never reply and no one 
knows anything. And then those studies are not replicable. Like that's what the f that study finds, right? So in an ideal world, everything would be shared. But of course, because of many, in some cases, interests behind, and in some cases, just the difficulty of the ethics. Sometimes it just doesn't let you. It's complicated to get a, co uh, you know, a full story there. Not everything, not everything is evidence of bias, I think, but many things are. Yeah, some stories are complicated, right? So uh, if the data, you were talking the other time at lunch about colonial science. Colonialism, yeah. Colonialism, yes, when like, a, you know, like a lab in the US is gonna come to uh, the lab in Mexico and say, oh, just give me your data. I can actually do much more better things with it because we have more, you know, Money. resources and people and blah, blah. And you're like, why, right? Like it's Mexican science with about Mexican populations, why will I give it to you? There is, there is some gray in there, like uh, when is uh, correct or not. But I just wanted to add that it's not only for data. It happens a lot with just knowledge in general, like some stories, some papers especially the ones that you see like very uh, complete research, really impactful research in, in journals as cell, that is like 12 pages, right? Like, and I don't know how many experiments. That basically meant that they kept their progress until the end, and sometimes it takes 10 years to publish, uh, because they wanted the very, very impactful story. But they actually had resources, uh, not resources, knowledge, results that will be meaningful for the community, and I just keep it for me because I want to have the biggest story, right? So it happens all the time, and it is a really, really good point. Okay, any other thing, or we move, move to confirmation bias? Okay, let's move. Okay, and now, oh sorry, we move to the last of the biases we're gonna see in this class today, confirmation bias. Who knows what confirmation bias is? Any idea? Tell us, tell us. You know because you put it in the questions. Yes. We already asked you about this, so you know. <laughs> I know a few of them. I think that it's giving more, art, more attention to evidence that goes in favor of your yes, hypothesis. Yes, that's right. This is a personal bias of scientists, right? Thank you. And I think we're all... We are all like this. We're all like this. <laughs> I mean, I, I, mean I, I maybe cannot talk about everyone, but I can say from personal experience that unconsciously, I have done this before because you have such an elegant idea in your brain and then you look, again, as I was saying, any gene can cause cancer, <laughs> according to the literature. So, you know, you have a story, yeah, of course, because you know, this pathway and whatever, and again, we're fooling ourselves, right? And looking for information that only supports what we already think is the definition of confirmation bias. So again, according to the great Wikipedia, Confirmation bias is a tendency of people to favor information that confirms or strengthens their beliefs or values, and it is difficult to dislodge once affirmed. It is an example of cognitive bias. Now, um, psychologists have studied this for a very long time, and there are some studies published in the literature about testing people you know, when they have formed an idea already and they have sources of information, like do they disprove it? Do they try to challenge themselves? And the result of many of these studies is that people already have an idea and they see information um, that supports it and then just become more convinced, right? And many people say that this, is, this has result, resulted in uh, this polarization of attitudes that we see uh, for example, in social media these days, right? So social media is like an echo chamber. For example, I talk a lot about Twitter because I use Twitter a lot. And I will only follow people that think like I do, right? I'm not gonna go and follow Trump. I mean, sorry, I'm not gonna do that because I get angry, right? And so, you know, you, you try to kind of say, yeah, I'm gonna follow reasonable people, right? And then you do that, and then the other side or other sides do the same thing. And then they start being like, yeah, 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 we are, we are in the right, and then, you know, the polarization starts to occur. And that's, you know, a big, a big part of why, confirmation bias is a big part of why we see basically everywhere, at least from what I can gather, uh, this massive polarization, right? Social media has completely made it uh, worse, let's say. So um, basically, uh, may, it, maybe later, as you can imagine, we will go to the uh, boards again, but maybe uh, we can discuss 
What is the role of this bias? Well, first, in the polarization of attitudes that we see these days, the perseverance of beliefs, that means even when people show you evidence to the contrary of what you think, you tend to dismiss that as, no, you probably did it wrong, or you know, this probably flawed because that's not a valid study. So we, th we tend to do these things. The irrational primacy effect, which refers to believing information that we see first, instead, you know, regardless of, just, just that we saw first, and then more information, you start forming your idea, and then the more information that comes, you're like, no, 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 but I, I already know, you know, because I saw some studies that this is true. Right, and finally, finding correlations again, or causations where there's only uh, correlations, right? So, um, we put this, <laughs> again, these this little uh, uh, cartoons that I think completely illustrate what confirmation bias is. So, in this square, this guy uh, says, you know, I've, I've you know, heard these two sides, I'm gonna do my own research, and then the first link that agrees with what you believe, they say, yeah, of course, I was right. <laughs> right, this, is, this happens a lot. And then this is more in the scientific uh, field. And this happens a lot, actually. And again, it's not, it, people actually believe this. Like they say, no, I mean, I did all these experiments and one agrees with what I say. The other ones, I probably did them wrong. You know, there was a mistake or something, probably not valid. So we're just gonna submit the one that agrees with what we think initially. And this happens more than <laughs> we would like it to be. And again, it's, not even a sign, I would say, of misconduct per se. It's like these biases that we just, it's not that we want to, to do misconduct, right? Or we have an agenda like, you know, I want to prove this. It's just a cognitive bias, it's, uh, subconsciously is there. And, and making ourselves aware of it is the first step to try and combat that. So, okay, that's just, that's your last, well, I think second to last for, for today. Uh, second to last, yes, second we to are going to have a final one. But yes, so again, five minutes by teams, and now you do the same but with confirmation bias, and we discuss it.
Uh, one more minute, guys. One minute. Okay, so let's move to discussion. Okay, so we have the first contribution here. Guys, we're about to finish, come on. Very close, very close. Then you can go for coffee. Well, I, I think a very interesting point that we're discussing here um, without necessarily getting, I think, to a very clear conclusion, but I think is the central question that um, you, you posed is, is, are we more biased today than we were in the past, right? And, and what is it that, that kind of motivates or, or generates these, these kinds of biases in us uh, through time? Right. Uh, even if we look in the past, were, were there societies that were developing science in a bit less biased way? How do our uh, kind of cultural context or informational context, more generally, uh, create bias in us? So I think this is a, these are very interesting questions. And uh, yeah, I don't know if any of you <laughs> have like a very clear opinion about that, but it, I think it's kind of the central one of the interesting points to make. Mm -hmm. Yes, so um, I don't think, this is, this is a really good point and I don't think what I'm gonna say answer it, it's just kind of contributing to it and something that I think of all the time. Um, I work in modeling as I was saying, right? So uh, modeling in a way is, is uh, basically making this abstraction of reality and you make something that makes sense in your head. This process is so related to bias, right? Like I, when we think about modeling in the very general way, very big picture way, our brains are really good at it because we basically, like if we are looking, there, there is a say, right? If you're looking for a chair, everything looks like a, uh, yeah. do you know what I'm saying? Anyway, it doesn't really matter. The point is like if you are already primed to see something, you tend to see it. You trend like, it, you, and in that moment you're gonna, you have a need, you will need to see it and everything is gonna look like a chair because it's, it's, it's just functional, right? So this is just to say that bias is not always bad. It actually makes our brain really efficient detecting things that we are looking for. We just have to be careful. And saying this, I think it relates to what you were saying, like, oh, are we now more biased? I, I don't think so. I think it's actually natural. It's an evolutive way for our brain to work. And, and then we can use it uh, you know, like take advantage of it, but it can also put us traps. Ha what can we do to check ourselves in those traps? I think, uh, and then that is the last uh, discussion we are going to have, like what we can do for the future. But that, that's a really good point. Do you yeah, yeah, very quickly, I do think we're more biased now than before. Uh, that's my personal opinion, just because of the massive communication um, capabilities that we have now of uh, be, uh, being able to connect with people on the other side of the world that think exactly like you. And that creates these echo chambers that has you know, created this polarization. And then we find more easily sources of information that agree with what they already think. And I really think this didn't exist before. And I really think that's, yeah, it's a difference. I, I really think so. But again, of course, I do not study formally these things, so I, I don't know, but I think that has an effect on how we behave now than how we behaved before. Uh, so uh, uh, the discussion was already stirred in the direction I thought of, uh, which is uh, there is 
some positive, some good aspects of how our brain work, which are very close to what we call confirmation bias. And uh, talking from where I come from, which is uh, pure mathematics, I, I can say that there is, there is a certain, uh, a certain useful uh, drive which is very close, as I see, as I see it in my brain, to confirmation bias, because. Uh, when you get to a very abstract level of mathematics, you do not have time to uh, to look very closely to at everything you're doing. So you you build confidence from the foundations of mathematics, which you studied very closely, uh, and then you go from stepping and, and closely watching the ground to striding, I think. So, uh, and then, uh, a certain intuitionistic process is is kind of uh, fundamental, and then then you go and, and and check things again, but perhaps you you try to 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 in, to uh, state a big theorem and and try to prove it, but you're coming from just a few results which you which you proved and, and a few examples which you studied, and then you go to that one and you're uh, now now I'm trying to rigorously prove that big theorem because I, I believe it is it to be true, and and that that drive of belief is is very close to 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 what confirmation bias is. So I think that the more you go to the theoretical side. And I think mathematics is in, in the utmost of that spectrum. Uh, that confirmation bias has to play uh, a role in in the thing. So, and I think in modeling, uh, the scenario will be very similar because you're 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 going towards that direction. And yes, I think that's a really good point. And I I, I would just say. In general, and I think, uh, of course, I don't have the background in mathematics, but I think uh, part of it is that you rely on your confirmation bias and whatever you believe before to kind of build the proof. But then you go back and you check your proof, right? Everything has to be done by itself. So it is okay, I think in mathematics is the perfect uh, way to think about this because it's very easy to control for everything. You know everything is gonna be there. Biology is more complicated because you don't have like everything so well defined in your space, but we should aim for the same idea. It's okay to use your confirmation bias to drive your exploration, but whenever you find what you were looking for, then you go back and you double check, right? That everything you are like standing up, it, it, it actually makes sense and it's not only because you want to believe in it. Uh, it's easier said than done, but I think that's the idea. Uh, yes, uh, actually we, we was talking about that and we say that we have to be careful t that the, this bias don't undermine your intuition because if you have uh, the data that confirm that you, your hypothesis but you have an intuition about one experiment but you decide not to do it because you have the data. <laughs> so, but we also say that um, this type of bias is in all the fields, not only in scientific, because it makes you feel comfortable with yourself. Mm -hmm. And basically the, the key of the, of the solution for the bias is the collaboration and to be uh, open mind and have uh, many collaborators and many ideas. Yeah, that's a really good point. Basically, having people from diverse backgrounds and diverse, where do, yeah, as diverse as possible, diverse uh, in terms of you know like cultural things, but also just in scientific backgrounds, uh, makes you like uh, it's, it's easier to find someone who's going to question your uh, confirmation bias here. And I just wanted to add that I found funny that you say like, oh, intuition might help you here, because for me, intuition and confirmation bias is basically the same. <laughs> this feeling that you get that, oh, that is, because I have intuition, uh, it's probably your bias, right? And, and it helps, sometimes it helps, but we have to be careful. Yes, I think that, uh, well, we have to be careful because the confirmation bias could also let us to manipulate the data in order to prove a statement that we have. So maybe it could be like a bad uh, idea in that way.
Yes, yes, and again, to make emphasis, we always think like, oh, manipulation of data, that's something only bad people do, I will never do it. But it's not always that you're fully changing something, right? Sometimes it's not like, oh, I'm actively and consciously saying like, ah, oh, I'm gonna, sometimes it's more subtle. And I think we all can sometimes do it and sometimes has consequences. So you will learn that you did it wrong, but sometimes it doesn't have consequences. So you keep up with your life and you didn't even realize that you manipulated something, right? Like, yeah, just be aware of it. I, I like that, um, this one that says, um, go after negative evidence for your love hypothesis. Uh, yes, this is, this is uh, something that in many cases people are afraid to do because it's like, oh, I built, you know, all this story and then if I do this crucial experiment, it may disprove everything. Uh, but it's, it's a really important point. I think I just would like to highlight that as, you know, sometimes we double check, as Maria was saying, when it doesn't agree with our hypothesis, but when it does, we just accept it and we don't double check anything. We should double check every, everything, right? But it's hard to do when, you know, um, we scrutinize more the results that don't agree with what we have. Um, we think. I just proposed this because confirmation bias is something more individual. So it, in some way, it is about our values, our internal values. Yes. So if the purpose of science is to pursue the truth, <laughs> you have to pursue the truth, even if it hurts you. So, and that's the reason why I proposed this because there's a theory of Karl Popper, which is a theory of fals falsifiability that is about the then a hypothesis must be falsifiable. Falsifiable to be a hypothesis, and right. Basically what I'm saying is that we Yeah, and that's what pseudoscience, like the hypotheses of pseudoscience are not falsifiable, and that's why anything can agree with whatever they say, right? You cannot really disprove them. So yeah, that's a good point about science in general. And you have that also driving the uh, conspiracy theories, right? People who follow conspiracy theories, then like it doesn't matter what you say, there is always that can go like, oh, but maybe blah, 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 right? Like you always have like the way around of it, so. Uh, okay. I, uh -huh. I just want to, to add a final thing very, very quickly. I think we're going to discuss this in another uh, class, but about the, the storytelling of the article and how do you put things together? And I think there is a very, uh, how can I say? It's very delicate what you choose to put, because in the end we don't put everything we found and we try to tell a, a beautiful story. And sometimes we get too carried away by the confirmation bias and tra trash out some important negative results that should appear on the article. But for the sake of the story to be beautiful, we don't. Yes, yes, really good point. And again, not black and white. Like sometimes you put it in the paper, but you know, you put it in the supplementary material somewhere like really, really deep. Or you choose uh, the graphics for that one that really doesn't highlight that much what you don't want them to see. So there is all these little things that we all do to one extent or another. And it connects actually to all the other biases, right? Like I want to publish. I don't want to lie, I just want to publish. And if I don't pretend this is, you know, like a cleaner story, they are not gonna let me publish. So yeah, that's a really good point as well. Okay, summary. Sorry. We've reached the summary, guys, um, for today. Uh, and we only saw three of the biases. I tell you, if you want books or something you're interested in, this is more about the society, society's role, uh, everything that surrounds us. Uh, how, how do they impact how we do science and uh, what our prior beliefs are? Uh, uh, you know, before testing and after publishing, uh, testing and publishing. Uh, but we analyzed three factors only, confirmation bias, incentives, and publication bias. And uh, okay, the summary is basically that those external factors um, may influence our data interpretation and their results in what, uh, in what we see in the literature. So the only thing we really can do, there's not a clean solution to this, this is an ongoing problem. So the only thing that we can do is try to be aware of these biases, have a diverse team as we were discussing because everyone will have a different perspective and, and it can help reduce bias if you have a diverse team uh, working on this. And also not only when analyzing your own data but when reading published literature, um, try to see can these authors be biased for some reason, who are the funding sources, uh, what is their previous work? Do they have a known agenda? Sometimes when you look up people that publish papers, you can see that they are active in some conspiracy theories, you know, boards and like, okay, maybe they have an agenda. You know, just be aware. If it's important for your research of what, what you're doing, it's important to know, you know, what the source of the claims that you're reading are. So that's it. We had a last board 
Um, I don't know if we do it now or... Yes, yes. So Five this minutes. is the last 10 minutes of the class. We are just going to close with questions as always. And I think for this one, um, if you agree, we are not going to do the teams. We are just going to do it all together. And I just ask uh, whoever of you that is, you know, like quick with typing, maybe n make notes of what we discuss. So yeah, if you can show it. That is the board number four. So I think uh, Daniela already, uh, I mean, it came out in the discussion, but also Daniela just uh, added something uh, about what we can do about this and is having a diverse uh, team, right? That, that is definitely something we can do to control, uh, uh, sorry, my English is not very good today. To contra-attack or whatever, um, to give some weight uh, against this, all of these biases, uh, not only uh, the confirmation one, but I think all the other ones as, as well. So what else? Who wants to think? It's brainstorming, so it's okay to have crazy ideas. It's just share and discuss. Didn't you have, okay, yeah. So this is, a, I think, a very personal thing of mine, but I, I, I would like to put it forth. Is I think that ever since the, the French Revolution, our societies have this very strong idea of epistemic and moral progress that I, I don't think is necessarily universal throughout human history. And maybe we should be a bit more skeptical of it as a kind of the, the belief that we are always going forward locally. I think that w one of the ways in which we see um, our confirmation bias kind of go away is simply giving things time. We, we see, we look back at societies that have had clear biases towards certain things and we can recognize that they were wrong because we are out of them. Um, but we are always kind of confined to our context. And I think to a certain extent, it's something that we have to accept as part of, of <laughs> anything, right? We, we always have a perspective. And there, there is, I, I think that part of a scientist is believing in a process that goes beyond our local existence and our local society. The, a belief that we can put things out there and if it's wrong it, it, and if it's biased in the long run, people, have the ability to, to notice that. So I think that's kind of a very philosophical approach to things, but it's one that I, I kind of take uh, towards, I guess, the big questions, right? Yes, thank you, thank you. I, I completely agree. I, I, if I had to summarize it like in one sentence, I would say we need to be more critical about science as an enterprise in general, and we need to be more critical as to, towards scientists as individuals and as a community. And I think if we are critical, if we apply the same skepticism to our old selves and our biases, um, we will do more good science in general. Yes, thank you. Um, who else wants to share? Someone wrote, I'm forced to make clear the source of funding. This is good, always good to know whose interests are behind your research or what you're reading at least. Yes, uh, I think that also maybe have a double check of your hypotheses, your no. experiments, your results, because it's better to have like more perspectives about the same thing. Double check always, not only when it doesn't agree with. <laughs> yeah, what that's say. a good point. Always, I, I think if you try to think about uh, yourself as the peer review person, right? Like try to be as critical with your work as you will be with other people. And uh, continue to talk about the peer review process, maybe enforce a double blind peer reviews to remove biases of not only uh, being lenient to results and articles from big names, but being more critical with results and articles from, as you said, Latin America and universities that aren't from the global north. That's a really good point, and I think Daniela might have better, uh, more clear opinion about this. That's a huge discussion. Like, if actually having double-blind uh, peer review process is actually helping. People already, like, especially in some fields, like, you read some work, and you're going to see as you progress in academia. You read some work, and you know who is who. 
especially you know who is who for the big names. So how much it actually helps, I think people is actually moving to the other direction of saying like, no, 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 everybody has to say who you are and then you have to be responsible for your peer review. Uh, but it's also complicated because there is powerful people in fields and there is retaliation. So it, it is a big discussion. I don't think anyone has, uh, do you want yeah. to add something? I mean, it's, it's an ideal world again. It's, it's, it would work this double blind peer review, but I have done double blind peer review and I immediately know who the person that is writing the paper is because they start with like, our hospital in Turkey, and it's like, I just know one group that would write this in Turkey. Like, you know, I know who they are. They remove the names, but I know anyway. So when you do, at least in my field, which is cancer, again, in specific types of cancer in developing countries, it's very hard to hide, you know, who's doing what? Because they describe their population, obviously, because you need to evaluate that. Like, well, the only people that could go and collect samples in Colombia about the very specific type of cancer is this group, right? So, uh, I mean, an ideal world, it would work, but I think it's a complicated, yeah. I mean, either hiding everyone's um, identities or revealing everyone's identities is problematic both ways. So yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know what the solution is. It's a good start. For some papers, you may be able, maybe in the mathematical sciences, maybe, because I don't know, at least you don't describe like populations of people that immediately, you know, tell you who is. Maybe we have a style. You can see the style on the modeling. Maybe. I mean, exactly. So maybe you already know as well. So it is, yes, it's, it's a complicated problem to solve. And those are good initiatives, but I, I don't know what the answer is to that. Uh, yeah, it's yeah it is point. a big discussion in the community. No one has agreed yet what is the best uh, point. But I, I think peer review definitely plays an important role on these issues. And we need to figure out a better way to do it. Because also, like we try now that the science is more interdisciplinary, you have two people doing the review. Sometimes those two people are not going to cover all the fields. Uh, that are involved and it's really hard to uh, like as as a reviewer sometimes it's like you read the paper and you say well actually the one that we did in journal club i was a reviewer and uh, for that paper i was like yeah i can tell you something about the modeling but i cannot tell you anything about the experiments i don't know if they are well done and uh, you have to say things like that right so it's, it's peer review is becoming more complicated and we also have more responsibility and we need to figure out how to do it better Okay, so who else wants to add something? I love this one. Embrace the errors, a part of knowledge building. Yes, it is, it is important because still, retractions of papers are very stigmatized. Uh, and obviously people want to avoid that at all costs. Which is something we, we want, I mean, we should be wanting to publish real things, of course, but mistakes happen and it's human nature, right? And we should not be, in theory, <laughs> in an ideal world, ashamed of retracting a paper that was based on an error. And still, you know, the papers I showed you when we were discussing like the NASA one, they're not retracted. I think only one of them was. And you know, the, uh, just the acid, the stem cells, that one is retracted. The other ones are not. And it's because the scientists are like, well, it could be a possibility. And they just will not accept that they made a mistake. In some cases, it can be just a mistake, right? So this, I think it's, being, it's becoming more visible and outlets like Nature are like interviewing scientists that have retracted papers to make it, you know, more, you know, mainstream, accepted, but it's still a long way to go. And I do think that this would um, help, again, with uh, reproducibility and these types of biases. So I hope that you have enjoyed the discussion. I think these are really important topics and they are really relevant. Again, espe especially for data-driven researchers because it's so flexible that it is just more vulnerable to these kind of things. But it's actually important for whatever you decide to do after this. If you, I, I will say even if you don't stay in science, these are important things to reflect in your daily life because I think someone mentioned this also affects basically all human activities, right? In different ways, but it does. The so decision to vaccinate your kids. Just for instance, to begin with. for instance, so like also people, you know, like delivery news should be thinking about this. Anyway, so just because we don't have much more time, please go to the questions. Uh, you have like, I'm gonna start counting five minutes now and then I will close it. But as soon as you are done with the questions, you are free to go. And thank you. Thanks guys.
Get ready for p-values and statistics again. Fun, fun, fun! <laughs>